Um, hello, everybody. My name is Emily Carlson. I am the program coordinator um, at Denver Scholarship Foundation, and I'm here with Natasha Garfield, who is the director of scholarships and financial aid. Um, and we are here to um, present the FAFSA CASFA financial aid fundamentals part one, which is preparing for the application. So um, today we will be talking about the steps leading up to actually completing the application. So first we'll be determining um, how to help a student figure out if they're doing FAFSA or CASFA. Um, and then we will talk about what dependency is and determining, determining the contributors or figuring out essentially um, whose information needs to be included on the application. Um, and we also will cover what information is going to be needed. Um, from there, we'll talk about creating studentaid.gov accounts, um, which are the accounts needed to complete and sign the FAFSA. Um, and then in closing, we'll just sum give a summary of this session and then preview the next session. And so just a quick reminder, when we, whenever we are working with a student or a family on a financial aid application, um, Encourage them to read each question and ask if they're or and ask you if they're unsure about how to answer. Um, we can't assume that we, as the people helping them, know how the student should answer the question unless you've read it carefully and discussed it with the student or family. So we're giving um, you know training on the fundamentals of how this should look, but it doesn't mean that we can assume every uh, that we know everything about what the student's going to say. So that's just something to keep in mind as we go through. Um, so the first step in completing financial aid is determining which application to use. So we have this graphic that we often use with our students and it is available in the um, financial aid binder, which you will all have access to and there's a link to at the end of the presentation. Um, so we can refer back to it, but essentially um, we just need to figure out is the student eligible for federal aid? So a lot of our students will be eligible for federal aid, and so that's money that's coming from the federal government. Um, and if that's the case, students can fill out the FAFSA, which is the free application for federal aid. In order to be eligible, students need to either be U.S. citizens or permanent residents or eligible non-citizens. So some eligible non-citizens are those who have I-94s or refugees or have asylum granted. Um, so the CASFA, on the other hand, is the Colorado application for state financial aid. And so this is for students who are not eligible for federal aid um, due to citizenship status, but they are able to get financial aid in Colorado through state funding. Um, so the CASFA can't be used out of state. So if you're working with a student who is um, undocumented and applying to schools that are out of state, they'll have to work with that school's um, financial aid office and figure out what applications they do need to complete. But for all of the schools in Colorado, they can use this um, and it will give the schools an idea similar to FAFSA of where their family is at financially and what kind of aid they're eligible for. And in order to be eligible for FAFSA, students um, need to have attended a Colorado high school for at least the year leading up to graduation and lived continuously in Colorado for a year. So um, we're going to invite you to pause the video for a moment to jot down um, some questions that you can ask a student to determine whether they should complete the FAFSA or CASFA. So imagine a student comes in um, and is working with you and you need to determine, you know, where do we start? And just keep in mind, immigration status can be a sensitive topic. Um, so it's really important to be mindful and, in use, and use inclusive language to show that you're here to support the student regardless of their status. Welcome back. Um, so some possible questions that you can ask the student. Um, and again, this is not an, an exhaustive list. It's just one that we know or these are a lot of um, questions that our advisors have used. Um, so you can also have the student look at the CASFER FAFSA chart, which was on the or a couple slides ago um, to identify which application they should complete. Um, you can just have like show it to them and kind of have them identify where they are at. 
Other questions may include where they were born. Um, depending on your relationship you have with the student, you can ask if they have a social security number, and if not, you can ask whether they have a green card, which would indicate that they're a permanent resident. Sometimes they don't know, so you can have them ask their parents. Um, and another question is, how long have you lived in Colorado? So from there, um, you can start to begin to look at dependency. And so dependency is essentially kind of just like whether the student needs to include parent information on the application. So most students under the age of 24 will need to pr provide parent information on the FAFSA or CASFA. So a student is required to provide their parent information if they're considered dependent, even if their parents is, don't financially support the student or claim them on their taxes. So that's a pretty big myth that we often hear is that people think that if the student isn't claimed by their parents on their taxes, then they're going to be independent, but that's not uh, the case. Um, there's a checklist here on the next slide where you can determine if the student who is under age 24 is considered dependent. So it's a little bit hard to look at, but this is also available in the binder so you can look at it more. Um, but essentially, or what it's asking um, is a bunch of questions to determine whether the student can be considered independent, meaning that they don't have to provide parent information. So some common ones that we see um, are students who are independent because, um, you know, maybe they were in foster care or they're in a legal guardianship as determined by the court. Some of our students will have dependents who um, rely on them for more than 51% of their financial support. Um, and if students are married, they're also considered independent. So there are some other scenarios, so it's worth looking into. Um, and all these questions are asked on the FAFSA, um, so it will walk you through it a little bit, but it's pretty helpful to know going in whether a student is going to need to provide parent information. And so with that, we can kind of come to the question of who is a contributor? And so a contributor um, is a vocab term you'll hear a lot, but for FAFSA, it means anyone who is required to um, provide information on the FAFSA and consent to release their federal tax information to federal student aid. A CASFA contributor is someone who is required to provide information on the CASFA and share details about their finances and incomes. So it's people who are giving their information on the application for the student. So contributors will always include the student, and then it can also include people such as the student's biological parent or parents, um, a step parent if the biological parent who provides more support has been remarried, um, or the student's spouse, um, so if they're married. Um, it is important to note that when we're talking about the term, using the term parent, on the FAFSA, we can mean a biological parent, an adoptive parent, or a step parent, but never a legal guardian. Um, so a student's legal guardian is separate from their adopted parent. So if it's a person who's been um, like legally adopted, those parents will be treated as like their biological parents, but we will never use a legal guardian on um, the FAFSA or CASFA. So this graphic is pretty helpful in helping determine who the contributors are. And it, of course, it's also available in the binder for you to refer back to when working with students and families. So the good place to start is always asking the student if their parents are married to each other. Um, and if that's the case, or if their parents live together, um, then the student will report both parents' information on the FAFSA and CASPA. If the parents um, do not live together, you can have the student determine who provides more financial support in the past year, who, who has provided more financial support in the past year. Um, and that can be kind of tricky to, to figure out sometimes. A good place to start is asking the student who they live with more of the time. If they say it's equal, you can ask them who pays for stuff, uh, or like who pays for more of their stuff. So that can be you know, items like clothes or food or you know, their cell phone bill, any other those type of payments can help determine who um, their contributor is going to be. And if that parent who provides 51% or more of the support is remarried, um, then their new spouse's information will also be included. 
if parents insist that financial contribution over the past year was completely equal, and sometimes they will, um, the best practice is to use parents with a higher in the parent with a higher income. And so the information that you will the contributors will include on the um, FAFSA or CASFA. Um, so this year it will be the 2023 tax returns. Um, so it's always from the previous tax year. Um, if they didn't ha file their taxes and have no tax return, you can use the W-2s. Um, but if income is above the tax filing threshold, which can be found in the binder as well, um, you can encourage gently encourage the family to file taxes as soon as possible. And we also have legal and tax resources available um, to help if that would benefit them. Um, other information that you might need is asset information, um, including the amount of child support relieved, received in the last year, if that's applicable, and the current balance of check, check, cash checking and savings accounts. That'll be a question for everybody. Um, as well as potentially other asset information, depending on the family's financial situation. And then lastly, the federal means tested benefits, if that's applicable. So I'll pass it over to Natasha. Thank you, Emily. Um, just a quick note on those federal mean tested benefits. That would include anything like SNAP, WIC, um, uh, Social Security, Disability, um, all would be types of Medicaid, um, all would be things that the family, someone in the family may have received, and they will just need to know that in order to check a box on the FAFSA. Now we're going to take another moment to pause the video. Um, when you get to the next slide, we're going to just have a moment to think about who are the contributors in each of the following scenarios. So if you have a piece of paper handy, you can jot down your responses um, after you've had a chance to review them. OK, so here is the slide. So please um, pause the video and take a moment to think through who will need to be a contributor in each of these scenarios. All right, so now we'll move on to talk about uh, the responses for determining contributors for each of these student situations. So for student A, um, Jose's parents are divorced. His mom remarried when Jose was 13. He lives with his mom and stepparent during the week and spends time with his dad on the weekends. His mom pays for his cell phone bill and most other expenses. So in this case, we're going to assume that mom is providing more support than um, biological dad. So Jose's mom and his step-parent will be the contributors. Because mom is remarried, the step-parent's information will also be required. And that's true even if the step-parent does not provide any financial support for Jose. Moving on to student B. In this scenario, Sam's biological parents were never married, but they lived together. In this situation, both of Sam's biological parents will need to be included on the FAFSA. If the parents file taxes jointly, one parent will need to have an account and will contribute to the FAFSA, but will be providing information about both of the parents. If the parents don't file taxes jointly, then each parent's gonna to need to have an account and each parent will provide information on the FAFSA. For student C, in this scenario, Ray has lived with their aunt since they were three years old and their aunt is their legal guardian. They don't have contact with their biological parents. In this situation, because Ray's aunt is their legal guardian, Ray will be considered independent for purposes of the FAFSA and will not provide any parent information. Ray's aunt will not be a contributor. Remember that um, any time a student is in a legal guardianship, they will be considered independent for FAFSA purposes and their legal guardian will never be considered their parent. Ray will be asked to provide proof of the legal guardianship to the financial aid office later after his FAFSA has been processed, and that will most often be in the form of a court order for legal guardianship. Now we're going to move on to talk about 
creating accounts. So first we'll talk about creating an account to complete the FAFSA. All contributors, whether they are the student, a parent, a step parent, or spouse, um, will be required to create their own individual account at studentaid.gov. This allows them to add information to the student's FAFSA and also is required so that they can electronically sign the FAFSA. If the individual has an existing account, maybe they created it for an older child, maybe they created it for themselves um, when they were in school and now they are a parent supporting their child's FAFSA completion, they can still use that existing account. And in fact, they will generally have to because it is tied to their social security number. In the past, these accounts were sometimes referred to as FSA IDs. Um, there are steps that a person can take to recover their username and password if they have forgotten um, how to log into or access that account. In a situation where um, there are two parents in the household and they don't file taxes together or jointly, each parent is going to need their own student aid account. And the reason for that is that the FAFSA is now set up to pull information directly from an individual's tax return through the IRS. So if the parents did not file jointly, then they each will need their own student aid account so that FAFSA can pull their IRS information. What each person needs in order to get started on creating their account is their full name, exactly the way that it shows up on their driver's license, passport, or birth certificate, or some other government-issued document. They'll need their birth date, and they'll need their social security number if they have one. Students are required to have a social security number, but one is not required for parents or spouses. They'll also need their current address. In addition, each person needs their own unique email and a mobile phone number. Um, the email and phone number cannot be used by another student aid account. So if a parent maybe doesn't have an email address, they will need to have one created and often students are able to take care of that task for their parents if needed. Once the person starts to create their account, they will need to choose their username and a password. They will also decide on their communication preferences. So that includes uh, what language they would like their communications to come in. And they'll have the opportunity or they'll be required to select challenge questions that can be used to recover their account if they can't um, access it by their email, username, or password. FAFSA does now require multi-factor authentication. So what that means is that each person setting up an account has to choose whether they want to receive a code to log in via their email, mobile phone, or an authenticator app. We generally recommend that um, everyone chooses both email and phone to verify because that just allows more options if they're in an environment where it might be um, a poor Wi-Fi signal or they're having trouble receiving messages through one of those me methods. Um, just a note that the, the codes that come through on mobile are obviously going to come through as a text. It's not that they will be receiving phone calls um, to verify their account. Everyone who creates an account does have to have their identity verified. The way that happens for people who have a social security number is that the Social Security Administration will match um, with the information um, submitted through studentaid.gov. For users who don't have a social security number, they'll be asked to answer some knowledge-based identity questions. So what those will look like are things like, which of these streets have you lived on? Um, which of these phone numbers have you had in the past? Which of these individuals do you know? Um, if there isn't a match based on those knowledge-based questions, then there will eventually be a process for parents without SSNs to verify their identity, but that process is on hold right now and will not be required 
for the 2526 FAFSA. It's important to note that it can take up to three business days for a studentaid.gov account to be authenticated. So students and parents should leave plenty of time for that, that verification to happen before they want to get started on the FAFSA. So another way of saying that is if, let's say, your FAFSA workshop is coming up on December 1st, um, it would be a, a good idea for students and parents to make sure that their accounts are created by November 23rd, just to make sure that there's plenty of time for that authentication to happen before they're ready to get started on the FAFSA. Now we're going to talk a little bit about CASFA login creation. Um, CASFA accounts can be created on the CASFA website, which will be linked in the, the binder that we'll share at the end, um, and also we'll include it in our follow-up materials. The CASFA um, is a simple account that just requires an email address and password. Um, each person does need to use, again, a valid, unique email address to create their account. And it's an important note for students that they should never use their school email when they are creating their account. So if they have a DPS email account, if they have a DSST email, a KIPP email, they need to use something, a personal email like Gmail um, when they are creating their studentaid.gov account. And that is because those high school emails will be deactivated when they graduate. Like with the FAFSA, if the parent doesn't already have their own unique email address, they will need to create one before they can create their CASFA account. Um, so hopefully that's something that the student can help them to do before um, they come in to uh, get their account all ready to go. For the CASFA, parents will create their account after they receive an invitation, um, an email invitation from the student to sign the CASPA. Um, and it is a very quick and easy process as long as they are starting with their own unique email address. All right, we're once again, again going to take a moment to pause the video um, and check out the DSF account creation flyer. So you can scan the QR code that's on your screen to access that flyer. And what we want you to do here is just practice um, creating and filling out the form as if you were a student uh, creating a CASPA account and also filling out the form as if you were a student creating your studentaid.gov account. And that's the purpose here is just so that you can become familiar with what students need in order to get their accounts created and what that process looks like. So please pause the video and take a moment to do that. All right. So we have reached the end of our content for today. We'd like to ask you to take a few minutes to just write down a summary for yourself of each section that we've covered, especially if there were any particular points that you noted in your mind and thought, this is something that I really wanna make sure that I remember. So some of the topics that we've talked about today are how to support a student in figuring out whether they're gonna complete the CASPA versus the FAFSA, identifying if they will be considered a dependent student um, and then need to provide parent information or if they will be independent. And that, that decision is true whether they're completing FAFSA or CASFA, same, same decision making there. We also talked about how to figure out who will be the contributors on the students FAFSA. So you'll remember we had an in infographic that helped them to figure out is it going to be one parent? If so, which one of the parents will it be based on who's providing more financial support? If um, the parent who will be the contributor is remarried, then that step parent will also be included. And then we talked about creating studentaid.gov or CASFA accounts so that the individuals can be prepared to log in and sign the applicable application. In our next session, um, which will be Financial Aid Fundamentals 2 coming up in December, we will be going over how to complete the applications 
and other steps that students need to take in order to receive their financial aid. So we encourage you to be on the lookout for that. We will send a recording of that session as well once it has been completed. Remember, when you're working with a student or family on a financial aid application, encourage them to carefully read each question and ask you if they're not sure what the question means. As you know from this session today, there are a lot of terms that have a very particular meaning when it comes to FAFSA or CASFA, and all of that information is probably gonna be new to the students and families you're working with unless they've had an older sibling um, go through this process in the past year or so. Don't assume that you should know the, that you should know or that you do know how they should answer those questions because it really will be unique to each individual. And even if you know the student pretty well, um, it's worth having that conversation about how to understand the question and how to figure out what the right answer is for that student and family. Last piece that we have for you is the um, link to the binder we've been referring to throughout this session. So this is a one-stop shop full of lots of great resources um, that will help you and the students and families you're working with to navigate the FAFSA and CASFA process. So we encourage you to scan it now, become familiar with it, um, bookmark the link so that you can come back to it anytime you have any questions when working with students or families. Thank you so much for joining us today and we appreciate you taking the time to watch this recording.